Welcome to the table. My name is Cody, and I get to be one of the pastors here. Um, we're in Mark chapter 14 today. Let me read that for us, then I'll pray and let, let you be seated, and we'll walk through this text, okay? Mark chapter 14, verses 26 through 31. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. Of course it was Peter. Said it. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, I want to thank you for your humility and your grace. The fact that you um, told Peter the truth about what was going to happen. God, I thank you for Peter. And um, I thank you for the, the heart that he had. But, but God, um, I pray that you would deliver me. From, um, from the thing that plagued Peter here in this text, overestimation of my own ability, my own courage, my own um, passion for you. God, would you um, work in us our need for grace? Would you, would you help us see that it is in weakness that there is strength? Um, would you help us... Um, become a little bit more self-aware of, of ourselves today and show us our, our need for you and how kind and how gracious and how loving you are. God, would you do that? In your good, good name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Um, the text opens up. Now, the, the immediate, pr the previous verses to this is they have just had the Passover. Jesus is Jewish, and he has a group of Jewish rabbi or group group of Jewish followers with him. He's a Jewish rabbi, and they are um, they're they're thoroughly Jewish. They're celebrating the Passover, and they're um, meeting together. They've just got through um, having the Passover meal, and then they leave out. That's what it says. Um, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So they were in Bethany. Bethany is probably about half a mile to a mile from the Mount of Olives. And they go, this is where they go, and, this is, and what's, hap, what's getting ready to happen at the Mount of Olives, he's going to pray. He's going to ask his disciples to pray with him. He's going to go a little bit further into the garden. He's going to take Peter and James and John with him, which is remarkable that he's still taking Peter with him after this conversation. And he goes, and they fall asleep, and it's there that he's arrested. And then the, the whole chain of events happens where he is tried, he is convicted, he is beat, he is flogged, he is um, crucified, which we are building up to. But they've had the Passover meal, they finished the meal, they sung a hymn. The hymn that they sung was probably Psalm 118. It's the traditional um, hymns, uh, hymns 115 through 118 were the hymns that they would have sung during that meal, and the end would have been that 118. And then they go out. So they're singing. And this Passover meal, what's interesting, I thought this was absolutely astounding, that in every one of the gospel accounts of the Passover meal that they enjoyed, it's never mentioned that they eat meat. Now some of you say, is he going vegan on us? No, I'm not. There's a, there's a deeper significance to this than just your diet. The Passover meal, what would have been happening, what would have happened in a traditional Jewish Passover meal, they would have gone, they would have offered this, this lamb as a sacrifice, they would have taken, they would have had bread, they would have had the bitter herbs, they would have had all these different kinds of things, and then they would have, they would have partaken of this sacrifice, this meat. And at none of the Passover meals that are mentioned, the, the, none of the Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciples do they mention him eating meat? They only mention the cup and the bread. 
And when I was studying this and I was reading this, it, it hit me. And it, it, Tim Keller is the one who said it. There wasn't a lamb on the table because the lamb of God was at the table. Like he is driving this point home that he is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That it's not what we're doing on this table. It's not what you've sacrificed. Presumably, they had not gone and offered a lamb at the temple. Jesus has already left the temple. He's not gone back to the temple. He's basically said, this is all coming down. Which you have to understand and probably like figure like in Peter's psyche, he's like, Lord, I've gone with you this far. I've not offered a sacrifice here at the table and I'm still here with you. And that gives us an insight into where a lot of our overestimation of ourselves and our own strengths and our abilities come from. We tend to go back and, and look at how much we've stuck with Jesus or what we've done for Jesus or what we've given up for Jesus and somehow think that that makes us right before Him. And it's not. It doesn't. There wasn't a lamb on the table because the Lamb of God was at the table. So as they go out, they're, they're going to mount the, the Mount of Olives and Jesus is saying to them while they're walking, and Jesus does this a lot, he, he talks to them on the way. He says, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now this is a quote from Zechariah, which is one of the minor prophets. It's toward, if, you, if you literally were to take and go past Mark, if you go backwards and you get to Matthew, and then you go another book backwards, you get to Malachi, and then you go another book backwards, you get to Zechariah. That's it. It's one of the longer books of the, of the minor prophets. And the context that's going on in Zechariah is Zechariah, some of God's people had come back. They had been, um, they were, had been deported. They had been um, taken out. They had been exiled from the, from the land of um, Israel. And some of them had come back. The temple was demolished and they started building it back. So some of the people, had, after a long exile, had, had come back. They'd started to try to rebuild their lives in Jerusalem, but discouragement had replaced their initial enthusiasm. How many of you are on a service team and you feel that? You've been setting up and tearing down for five years. You've been serving your kids for five years. You've been working, you know, like, you, you, like you have this initial enthusiasm, but discouragement happens. Like, and, and you think about, well, what's going on with the disciples with Jesus at that time. Like, they've been following him for three years. He hasn't overthrown the Romans yet. And he keeps telling them about this day that he's going to die. And that doesn't have any... We have no category for a Messiah who's going to die. So this is all the context of what's going on in Zechariah. Only the foundation of the temple had been rebuilt. Sacrifices were not happening. Worship was stymied. Taxes were high and life was hard because the ruler who still owned Jerusalem, was preparing for another war and was taxing the Dickens out of the... Dickens doesn't happen very much in our sermons. So anyway, but just taxing them like crazy, trying to pay for this war that he's trying to do. Life was hard, and God, through Zechariah, was reminding his people that though hidden, he was watching everything, and when the time was right, he would act. And the latter chapters of Zechariah speak of a new ruler that would come to Jerusalem, not like the existing rulers, but one who was righteous, who was humble, who was bringing salvation, and would remove all sin from their land. And he would be from the line of David. Zechariah called him the righteous branch. Jesus is telling them the truth. He is telling them that he is that branch. That God is getting ready to remove all the sin from their land, and so much more. But, in order for that to happen, there is a scattering that must happen, which is quoted from Zechariah 13, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now, why Jesus is telling them this is because He knows that He is the righteous branch, that He is that shepherd, and He is going to be struck, and they will be scattered. 
He is telling them the truth. He's telling them what is going to happen. And, but here's what's fascinating. I, don't want, I, I want to immediately jump in to what Peter says in this, com, in, in this conversation. But before we get there, look at what he says. Verse 28. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Now here's what's fascinating about this. In all of the times in Mark's gospel, I'm going to read every one of them. We've just read the fourth one. I'm going to go back and read the previous three. In every instance in Mark's gospel where he mentions that he is going to be crucified, that he mentions that he is going to die, that he is going to be handed over to the chief priests, the elders, the, the, the high council, that he is going to die for our sin. In every single instance, he always mentions his resurrection. Jesus never mentions in the Gospel of Mark his crucifixion without mentioning his resurrection. Look at Mark chapter 8, verse 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. See it? Mark 9, 31. I don't know why all these are 30 verses apart, but they are. Mark 9, 31. For he was teaching his disciples, I don't know the 30 verses apart, they're just, uh, they start with 30s. But Mark 9, 31, he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. Mark 10, 34, they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And then here in our text in chapter 14, After I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Jesus never mentions his crucifixion without mentioning his resurrection. This is not the main point of the message, but I think this is a good tactic for us as we share the gospel with our friends, with our family, preach the gospel to ourselves. Never present the death of Christ without finishing with the resurrection of Christ. If you do, you are preaching an incomplete gospel. Don't preach an incomplete gospel. Now, I, I have a tendency to do this. You have probably noticed it in my preaching. I have a tendency to do this even when I'm preaching the gospel to myself. I was convicted as I was studying this. and it, like I tend to major on the crucifixion and minor on the resurrection. I tend to... Think of the resurrection as an afterthought. And that's not it at all. It is the thing. Paul goes so far to say, if Christ is not raised, we of all men are most to be pitied. You have no gospel without the resurrection. Now to be sure, you also have no gospel without the crucifixion. But... We want to focus on this. And I understand, I, I do this. But hear this. And I'm so glad that we are part of a church that sings it this way, that we sing the gospel, that the very manner in which we sing communicates the truth of the gospel, that it is the minor chord. I don't know, I'm not that musical. So I may be overstepping my bounds here. I realize I'm getting out of my lane. Y'all can correct me afterwards. Kyle's already corrected me beforehand, but it's better this way. So it's the minor chord is the crucifixion. The major chord is the resurrection. And the way that we sing it, we sing like it's, it's solemn as we sing the crucifixion. And then you'll notice it if you just come and stay here for a while, that when we get to the resurrection, it is boisterous, it is loud, it is a crescendo. That's the way it is supposed to be. I even said crescendo that way so that I could reinforce the point of it. You understand this. It, that's what we are supposed to do. But may the resurrection always get mentioned with the crucifixion. A dead man cannot save, but a resurrected one can. A, crucifix, a crucified Savior only cannot save but a resurrected Christ can. We do not put our faith and trust in merely a dead Christ. It's why we don't have crucifixes. We are not denying the reality of the crucifixion, but that cross is empty. He is alive. This is what we proclaim. 
He is alive. Now we get to the conflict. And I am not overstating that. It is a conflict. And we see it when first, when Peter pushes back on Jesus. Now that may not constitute a conflict. But then when Jesus pushes back on Peter, Peter again pushes back again. And in verse 31, he said emphatically. And we're going to we're going to break open that word here in just a moment. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Now let's just stop right there. If you're one of the other disciples, <laughs> Peter, shut up. <laughs> we all know. <laughs> we all know you. <laughs> Why, why do you think you're so much better than we are? But don't we, I mean, aren't we all a little bit like Peter? Well, they might do that. I remember saying this um, before I had children. <laughs> My kids will never... <laughs> yeah. All right. Jesus says, Peter, you, you don't know yourself as, as well as I do. And can I just tell you that you don't know yourself as well as Jesus knows you? Okay? One of the things that I've, I'm learning as I'm getting older, and I, here, here's the thing, I've, I, the longer I was in school, the more I figured out I didn't know. And it's kind of the same way with aging. All right? The longer I'm alive, the more I figure out, like, the, what I hope my life as I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm turning, like, I think it's this next week. I, see, I'm so old, I don't even know when my birthday is. So, like, I think it's this week. I, I'm, getting, I'm re getting ready to turn 49. That means I'm a lot closer to 50 than I am to 40. Right? I hope that as I'm approaching my 50s, I hope that I will say less in my 50s than I did in my 40s and 30s. Well, I'll tell you what I would do. I hope that I will have the humility to say, man, I don't know. Now keep in mind, Peter is probably in his 20s or 30s, so you got to cut him a little slack. Okay? I'm not saying, if you're 20 or 30, calm down. You're, you're, you'll get there. It's fine. It's, you're, but you just don't know a lot yet. Okay? You just don't. You don't know as much. You haven't lived as much. But this is, and, and here's the thing. Jesus is only 33, but I mean, he's, you know, he's been around for a lot longer than that. So he knows some stuff. Even if they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly. So this is like, no, somberly. Like, truly, Peter. Amen. Verily. Peter, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not just like joshing you. I'm not saying this for like, you know, to get your attention. This is not hyperbole. This is the truth. This, this night, like what I, we're going out here, I'm going to pray. This is going to go on all night long. Early in the morning, before the, like they're going to arrest me. And then this thing is going to start taking place. I'm, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny that you even know me. You're going to distance yourself from me. You're, you're totally going to say, I don't know who you are. And at that, Peter pushes back, and that's where he says emphatically. Now the word there, emphatically, means more than extremely. More than extremely disagreed with Jesus. Now, let's just use... What, when you hear that someone more than extremely disagreed with Jesus, how do you think that that went? <laughs> do you think that that word, which is in our authoritative, infallible, like inspired word of God, that it's in there, do you think that Peter like sat back, you know, and, uh, against the olive tree and stroked his beard and said, well, I really disagree with you there, Jesus. 
No. No. We know that Peter is a type A personality. We know that Peter tends to get emotional. He's going to chop off a guy's ear. We know that that's in him, right? So what do you think it means when he, when he says more than extremely, when he replies, when he disagrees with Jesus more than extremely? I don't know what your personality type, and I don't know how that is when you land it, and, but y'all don't have the mic, so I, I get to tell you what I think, okay? But, so, but I, I, think, I think that his voice probably went up a little bit, and he tended to get louder, and like, I think he's doubling down. He's just doubling down his bluff, and Jesus is just calling his bluff. So, I'll, I'll give you this. This happened just this morning. This is not in my notes, because it just happened this morning. So, I've been, you, I, I went through this bottle of cologne that my son got me. And now I'm having to use this other bottle of cologne that I don't like that my wife got me. All right? No, it's, hey, listen, I, that's fine. She, she, I mean, so I told her I want some new cologne. Lori, if, I repent if I need to, but I'm going to tell a story. Um, it, 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 it's a little bit too sweet. I don't, I, it, it, but, I, but I wear it. You've probably smelled it, and the, nobody said it smells terrible. So it's not like, a, it's not like she gave me like skunk spray. For cologne, it's it's not that bad, but I don't prefer it. I prefer something different. And Silas came in. He had a he he got he got this gift card, and he went to American Eagle, and he said, "Hey, I got this new cologne." And we're like, "Oh, let's smell it." So, because I'm kind of like thinking, this is what we'll do. And I we've been saying this. We'll do this on a date night. We'll go get some new cologne because Lori's like, "I want you to pick out the cologne," you know, right? But she gave me this condition. She said, "Not until you use up all of this." Because she is the saver and I am the spender. So I smell this new cologne and I'm like, I oh, know, I want to get that new cologne. And, and she made the mistake of telling me that I had a gift card from my mom, from American Eagle, which was the place where the cologne came from. I'm like, let's go get it. She goes, after you use all of your other cologne. Now, let me, I, I got to tell this story to finish this story. So let me go back. We used to serve on staff with a guy and his name was Randy. And Randy must have put on a bottle of cologne every day. You could, I literally, I'm not kidding. Now, this sounds like a preacher story, but this is not a preacher story. I literally, I pulled up in a parking lot, and when I got out of the car, he was walking, and I'm not, I, he was 20 yards away, and I smelled him. <laughs> and that is not, that is no exaggeration. There was a wind blowing, but still. Okay? So, my reply to her, I said, well, fine. I'm going to start putting on that stuff as thick as Randy. I'm trying to bluff. I'm saying more than extremely. I'm saying emphatically. And you know what my wife did? She called my bluff. She totally called my bluff. She goes, that's what I want you to do. At which point, I didn't do it physically, but in my heart, I stuck my tongue out at her. <laughs> she totally called my bluff. Jesus is not being taken off base. with He is, he is calling Peter's bluff. Peter, I know you think this about yourself. Peter got loud. He doubled down. Jesus called his bluff, and he just couldn't bring himself to admit that Jesus knew him better than he knew himself. And none of us do. No, none of us in this room know ourselves better than Jesus knows us. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said one time that he was well aware of the sin that resided in him, what he was capable of doing. I want one of our values is brokenness. Okay? Now I know that that strikes some people that are new to our church, like that's kind of a weird value to have. Here's what we I mean. Like we don't value like we aren't just valuing going around breaking things. Like we just value honesty about brokenness. 
And someone that kind of never admits to having problems, that's a red flag. And it should be. Because you're overestimating yourself. It's this thing right here. It's Peter. It's Peter saying, well, they may all do it, but I never will. Did Peter do that? Oh, yeah. Crashed and burned. Peter thinks too highly of himself. He thinks of himself as the exception rather than the rule. He insinuates that he's better than the other disciples. He overestimates his courage and his loyalty. And perhaps the most damning thing about this is, as he speaks forward as the leader, the other disciples say the same thing. He leads them to overpromise as well. Listen. Overestimation of ourselves is rooted in underestimation of Christ. He still wasn't seeing Christ as he needed to see him. Overestimated, overestimation of yourself, and we're all prone to do it. I don't want us to sit here and think and say, Oh, yeah, Peter was like that, but I'm not. No, 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 you are. And if you say, No, I'm not, you're doing it right now. It'll take you a while to catch that. Maybe by Thursday. It, it's fine. It, you're, you're doing, if, you're, if you're saying, I'm not like that, you're doing what Peter did to the rest of the disciples. Quit it. Stop. You're not better than Peter. You're not better than the person sitting next to you. You're not better than the person standing on the stage. And I certainly am not better than any of you. We're all capable of this. Overestimation of ourselves is rooted in the underestimation of Christ. Secondly, and this is so good, this is so good, overestimation of ourselves doesn't stop Christ from accomplishing His plans. It doesn't stop Him. Look at what He says. He says, you're going to deny Me. You're, you're going to be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go ahead of you and meet you in Galilee. Like, he says this knowing that Peter's going to deny him, knowing that Peter's going to distance from him, and Jesus, his compassion, is still like, no, I'm still going to rise from the dead. My resurrection does not depend on whether or not you think I'm going to do it or not. My resurrection certainly doesn't depend on whether or not you can stop a servant by the name of Malchus with a sword by cutting off his ear. My resurrection hinges upon my death, which you're trying to prevent because you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. My resurrection is going to happen. My death must happen for my resurrection to happen. And Peter, I know that you're fighting me tooth and nail all the way to this until it's going to really get down to where the rubber meets the road, and then you're going to deny me. You're going to be so scared, you are going to curse. You're going to like say with more than extreme that you do not know me to save your own skin. And Peter, I'm still going to love you anyway. I'm still going to say you are mine. I'm still going to come after you. James Edwards says the kingdom of God that Jesus brings and embodies cannot be scuttled by human failure. He who first called the apostolic band at the Sea of Galilee will again call and reestablish them at the Sea of Galilee. The third thing that I want us to know about overestimation. Overestimation of ourselves never reduces Christ's love for us. It's okay to admit that you think a little more highly of yourself than you ought. If you can admit that, that's a really winsome thing to say to people. But if you think that and you can't see it, people just don't like you. <laughs> How dare you say that people don't like you? I know, well, it's just the truth. It's just the way the world operates. 
If, you're, if you think more highly of yourself than you ought to, and you're blind to it, it other people aren't. They're not. Some of them will be kind enough to tell you this about yourself. But most people won't. Jesus is kind enough to point out Peter's flaws and his failures. And he loves him despite that. In spite of that. That does not deter him from loving Peter. You cannot out his grace, you cannot outrun his reach, and you cannot outperform your need for him. You can't. It's just the way the world works. We're broken. We're in need of a Savior. We're in need of rescue. We're in need of redemption. We're in need of somebody who can love us despite all of our flaws and our failures and our bluffs and our over-extreme rebuttals. He, we need that. And Christ is that. So here's what we, I want to do as we wrap this thing up. Are you overestimating your ability to save yourself? Are you putting your hope and your trust in your performance or how good you are compared to everybody else and that you're in the top 20 percentile? Are you underestimating your need for Jesus? Are you trusting in your ability to be better than most? Is the object of your faith your own ability? I'm going to kind of put this real simple because I'm, I'm, this is the, I'm given three invitations. The first invitation is if you don't know Christ, if you're putting your hope and faith in, in your own ability or your own you know, um, works, I'm gonna, I want to give you the ability to, or not give, I want to give you the opportunity to repent of that. But I want to ask just a few questions. Do you believe that there's a God? These are, these are basic things. You must believe these things if you're going to be a Christian. Do you believe that there, that, that there is a God and that Jesus Christ is the one and only Son of God? If you do, great. But that's not enough to save you. Do you believe that Christ died for your sin and rose from the dead? That's, I hope you do. You have to believe that to be a Christian. Do you believe that Christ alone makes you right with God? And that none of your works improve that position? That's what you, you need. It's not Jesus did this, but He loves me a little more because, you know, I vote Republican. No. It's, it, it, it's not Jesus loves me a little bit more because... I serve on a team. No. It, it's not that. Do, do you believe that Christ alone makes you right with God? And then the last one, you see, you can believe those things and still not fully like invest in, and put yourself in His hands. Are you willing to repent of your sin of overestimation of your ability? Are you willing to repent of your sin, repent of... A Jesus plus theology. Jesus, like, you know, I, I believe in Jesus and a little bit of my own ability. Are you willing to lay that aside and say, my only hope and plea is Christ? And then follow Him wherever He leads. If you answered yes to all four of those things, or five or however many it was, then I, I want to encourage you. I'm going to explain communion here in a minute. People are going to come and take communion. And I want, if, if you became a Christian today, you said, and I've never understood the gospel that way, but this is, okay, that's where I'm at. That's, I, I want to do that. And I want to invite you, as people are coming forward to take communion, I'm going to be sitting right over there. And I want to invite you to just come sit beside me and just tell me that you became a Christian. You say, well, I don't know if I want to do that. Okay, I'll give you another opportunity. I'm going to be back there in the lobby afterwards. You can come talk to me then. If you say, well, man, I don't know if I want to do that. Can we get coffee? Yes, but you've got to give me your phone number. <laughs> You're like, if you became a Christian, come tell me. Or come tell somebody that you came with. But let's, let's talk about that, okay? Last, or well, secondly, the invitation is for communion. If you are a believer, 
We want you to come and take. When you come and take communion, by taking the bread and the cup, you are saying, this Jesus is my Savior. His death delivers me from sin. This is all my hope and plea. It's not Jesus plus anything else. It's just Christ. So we come to the table humbly, recognizing that it's not our righteousness or our good works that are the basis of our relationship with God. It's not the amount of our faith. It's the object of our faith. It's, it's, it's the object of it, not the amount of it. So we invite you to come take communion. If you are a Christian, you're, a, you're baptized, you're, you're, I'm not saying you have to be perfect, but you're walking in repentance. You're, your hope is in Christ. And we invite you to come take communion. Demonstrate, proclaim that this is where your hope lies. And then lastly, say, well, I'm not ready. If I'm, I don't know if I'm ready to take communion yet. I don't know if I'm a Christian. That's fine. You can come to see me. Or if you're not ready to do that yet, after everybody gets back to their seats, Kyle's going to start singing. Stephanie's going to sing with him. And we're going to start standing up and we're going to sing to this God who is worthy of all of our praise. And just stand and sing with us. You say, well, I don't sing good. That's fine. Stand and be sung over and listen and receive. Okay? I'm going to pray for us. We invite you to come take communion. If you're not a Christian, I would love to talk with you. All right? Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace. God, we ask that you would move among us. Lord, that you would help us to... um, not overestimate ourselves. Lord, that you'd help us to embrace vulnerability and and just honesty. Lord, that you'd help us to be a little bit more self-aware than we might naturally otherwise be. But God, would, would you help us not to do that without looking to you? May we not press so much into the crucifixion that we forget the resurrection, that it's it's you who rose from the grave, that you you have the power to change to change us. That a, a dead Savior can't point out our sin. Only an alive one can. So God, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. God, would you lead us now? Would you receive our praise? Would you be pleased as we come forward and participate in your death, burial, resurrection? As we proclaim that this Christ saves saves us from our sin. This risen Christ, by His death, saves us from our sin. In your good name we pray. Amen.